Hello, my name is Laura Roberts. I am the Northeast Regional Coordinator for the Oklahoma Family Network, and I wanted to share my NICU journey uh, with you. Um, I had had the perfect pregnancy after waiting eight years to get pregnant. Um, there was no issues. Uh, everything went great. Uh, Jeremy was born at 41 and a half weeks, but shortly after my OB broke my water, he went into fetal distress, and within minutes, we're doing an emergency C-section. So he was diagnosed with hydrocephalus at birth because he only weighed five pounds and three ounces, even though he was 41 and a half weeks. So the doctor noted that his head was larger than it should be. So that started our NICU journey. He entered the NICU, and that night they let me go down and see him, but that's the loneliest walk from your room to the NICU because I remember during birthing class, they took us by the NICU, and they tell you that if your child enters the NICU, they're going to be really sick. So that's what's in my mind. You know, what's going on? I didn't understand what hydrocephalus was. Uh, we had talked to the neurosurgeon, but they're pretty blunt in their explanation. So it was a relief to see Jeremy and know that he was really just there because he was going to have surgery the next day. So he had the shot placed the next day. He did really well. Um, because he only weighed 5'3", they were running all kinds of metabolic tests, genetic tests, and everything kept coming back normal. So they did a CAT scan to check the shunt to make sure it was placed right, that the ventricles just went down, and that revealed he had a brain abnormality. So we had to do an MRI. Well, the MRI then revealed that he had a genesis of the corpus callosum, and that kind of started, wow, you know, he's not just in the NICU because he was going to have surgery. He's got something going on. Then day six, they uh, heard a heart murmur, so they did an echocardiogram. And that night, the cardiologist comes to Jeremy's little NICU pod and tells us that he has a pretty significant heart defect, uh, overriding aorta, mitral valve stenosis, uh, a BSD, a small ASD. I mean, every part of his heart had something going on. And that uh, his words were, we hope he will wait till he's a year old to have surgery. My thought as a mom was, is he saying that we hope your son doesn't die before he's a year old so he could have surgery? Uh, what he meant is they wanted him to grow as much as they could before surgery. Uh, we lived in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, so we were driving 20 minutes both ways. We were leaving the NICU at 1030 because I couldn't leave Jeremy. I just, I didn't want to. And I would pump three times during the night. Each time I got up to pump, I was calling the NICU, his NICU nurse, just checking on Jeremy. And we would get up at 530, go back over there, and we were just exhausted. And then hearing the part about his heart was just overwhelming to me. Well, that day, the NICU social worker, you know, I was sitting by my son's pod crying because I'm thinking he's going to die before he's a year old. Uh, she got us a room at the Ronald McDonald house. So that kind of helped where we didn't have to drive back and forth to Sepulpa. But that day, one of the nurses come up to me and she, uh, I probably cry, but she put her hand on my shoulder and uh, she went and got a rocking chair. And she got Jeremy and she handed me him and she said, this is your baby. We're just here to take care of him. And from then on, I thought, okay, this is my child from, you know, before I wouldn't hardly hold him because he had all these monitors, all these wires, and I was afraid. And then day 11, they send us home and I'm thinking, I can't take care of this baby, you know, he's you know, I had all these signs to watch for. If his lips turned blue, if his fingers turned blue, he could have a seizure. And uh, luckily, they set us up with a home nurse that would come in and check him over and make sure everything was going good. Um, he survived the first year. I say survived because there was no thriving. Uh, he had heart surgery two weeks after he turned a year old, and he only weighed 14 pounds. But he, like I said, he just thrive he survived during that time after his heart surgery it was a total complete success then he finally started thriving he started learning to meet some of his milestones that before he was not doing 
it started my mission and my passion to want to help other families because I remember what it was like in the NICU. I probably wouldn't have reached out to another mom, but if another mom had come up to me and started talking, I would have welcomed that. So now 21 years later, that's still my driving focus and my mission and my passion. Uh, one of the things I love about OFN is one of the things we say is we understand and care because we have been there. Who better understands a mom in the NICU than a mom that's been in the NICU that has a similar diagnosis? And sometimes the diagnosis doesn't even matter. It's just you've been in the NICU. You understand that you're leaving nights exhausted and you're crying over your kid's crib. You maybe don't understand what's going on. So we can match families with another trained support parent. Uh, that's the flagship of what the Oklahoma Family Network does. Uh, normally before COVID, we would have a NICU coordinator, uh, Kim Beeler. Uh, she comes up to the NICU and she visits families. And sometimes if she can't come up, um, I will step in and come visit the families. Um, that's still a mission and a passion to me to be able to offer that support. Uh, we can also do care notebooks for families, which is just a notebook to show them how to put all their child's information in one place. And that's really good when they're in the NICU. Um, I wish I had had that because when my son left, we left with a long list of diagnoses and a long list of doctors to go see. So it would have been helpful to have that NICU uh, discharge in that notebook and just some information what doctors we were going to go see because uh, honestly at the time, I didn't know the difference between a neurosurgeon or a neurologist. So we can help families with that. Uh, we can do book parties where we can set outside the NICU, get the moms to come out, uh, maybe with the typical child, and uh, help them see how reading is important to the child. And then they can also read to their babies in the NICU. Um, I read to my son all the time. I talked to him. I treated him like he was just a typical child. Uh, some of our NICU coordinators, uh, they start support groups in the NICU. Uh, we can help uh, NICU families find support groups in the area. Um, I actually have a support group in Tulsa. Uh, it's for families who have genetic, metabolic, or some medical conditions. Because some kids in the NICU, even though uh, they were born typical, they might go home with some medical issues. And that's something my group can relate to. We can also help families find resources in the area. Uh, there's a lot of financial resources that sometimes families don't know about. Uh, in the Tulsa area, something that I get to do that's another one of my favorite things to do is uh, SIB shops. And that is for the brothers and sisters who have a sibling with special needs. Uh, we do ages five to 14. So that them kids get to come and talk to other siblings who's, well, my brother's in the hospital again, or my sister's sick, mom's with them, so I have to be with grandma, and that's pretty common. And so these kids kind of build that same kind of support that families build talking to another family in a similar situation. So we really appreciate what the NICU nurses do. Um, you know, some families just fly through the NICU. Some like me were struggling and we might just need that little hand on the shoulder or maybe a gentle, have you ever heard of the Oklahoma Family Network? Um, they'll be up to visit maybe if you would like to talk to them and just send us the referrals this is what we do and this is what we love to do so i thank you for your time and we appreciate you